بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على النبي الامي برحمتك يا ارحم الراحمين الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى has given us توفيق to have this discussion in regard to the sahaba of rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم الحمد لله we would discuss rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم's relationship concerning number one the jews of medina munawwara and also what were the jews like at that time and who of them finally did embrace islam and became from the sahaba of rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم So from what backgrounds, what positions Allah allowed certain people to reach when they really had sincerity and truth and purity. When one wants truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides this person. In the Qur'an Kareem, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks highly in certain places in regard to the Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and the Christians. They are referred to as the people of the book. In Surah Baqarah, the second chapter of the Quran Kareem, Surah Baqarah discusses lots in regards to Ahlul Kitab, the Jews. Surah Ali Imran, meaning chapter 3 and chapters after that, discuss the Jews and the Christians in lots of detail as well. So we learn Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa interacted with them. So like this, from this discussion inshallah, this could enlighten us. In regards to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's and Sahaba radiallahu anhum's interaction with different, different people. Just to rewind before the Medinan period, because in Medina Munawwara, we learn historically, the Jews were living there for centuries. But prior to that, let's discuss the Meccan stage, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was in Makkah Mukarramah, and he was inviting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he was calling the different, different people of Makkah to the greatness of Allah. He would advocate to them. He would invite them, taking every opportunity. But when Quraysh realized that they were not managing to stop the efforts of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so they tried posing certain questions. And Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would bring the answers. And then they tried offering Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam every sort of privilege or pleasure for him to stop the invitation to deen. Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam totally refused, saying that this is not from me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent me. And then, لَوْ وَضَعُوا الشَّمْسَ فِي يَمِينِ Allah's Nabi would say, even if were they to place the sun in my right and the moon in my left, no matter what they can do for me, I can never ever forsake this effort until I die fulfilling the objective for which Allah has sent me. I will carry on in this effort of deen reaching the entire humanity and Allah will make it reach success Allah will make it triumphant and in that if my life is given I am successful then the Quraysh tried a different strategy when they realized that their line of questioning was foolish and opinionated they then consulted to send certain people to Medina Munawwara known at that time as Yathrib so they sent Nadar bin Harith and Uqba bin Abi Mu'eet with the objective of speaking to the Jews. Because their information, from according to the Meccans' understanding, regarding Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was more meticulous. And they wanted to make meticulous inquiries to find out more about Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because the Jews were known to be the people of the book. So on this occasion, the Jews told them, okay, pose these few questions. Number one, ask Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about the people who sought refuge in a cave. What is their incident? And the other thing you should ask him is about the man who traveled the entire earth. He traversed from east to west. In other words, ask about Dhul Qarnayn. And the first question is about Ashab-i Kahf. And the third question you pose to him is in regards to the Ruh. Ask him about the soul. The Jews, Jewish scholars additionally advise that if Muhammad ﷺ provides answers to the first questions, meaning Dhul Qarnayn and Ashab-i Kahf, and he remains silent about the third, this is a sure sign of his prophethood. Otherwise, he's a liar. These Meccans were flamboyant and joyful over this. And when they posed these questions to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, days later when the answer came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the response of these questions came in the form of Surah Al-Kahf and Surah Al-Isra. And interestingly, the verses started with this verse, 
which is verse number 23 and 24 of Surah Al-Kahf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, after a'udhu billahi minash shaytani rajim, bismillahi rahmanir rahim, we read, وَلَا تَقُولَنَّ لِشَيْءٍ إِنِّي فَاعِلٌ ذَانِكَ غَدًا إِلَّا أَنْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهِ وَاذْكُرْ رَبَّكَ إِذَا نَسِيتَ وَقُلْ عَسَى وَقُلْ عَسَى أَنْ يَهْدِيَنِ رَبِّي لِأَقْرَبَ مِنْ هَذَا رَشَدًا Oh Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم, never ever utter that I will accomplish or fulfill this in the morrow or tomorrow. Unless you couple with your determination, you couple with it, insha'Allah. From there we learn the importance of insha'Allah. Then the verse says, and if you had forgotten to say insha'Allah, as soon as you remember, take Allah Ta'ala's name and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his help. So interestingly, as Muslims we learn, whatever we intend, always take the help of Allah Ta'ala and always connect it to the will of Allah. Because what can we fulfill without the wish and the help of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala? Another lesson we learn is we should not use inshallah as a scapegoat to mean that we won't actually accomplish this. But inshallah is to seek Allah Ta'ala's help and connect everything to the will of Allah. Like Hazrat Umar who would say that I recognize Allah with this fact that bifaskhi azaimi, that everything that I want doesn't always happen. I realize it happens only and as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants. And when we accomplish something, it's through the help of Allah, due to the help and the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then the, uh, the answers were given. The story of Ashab Kahf came in a lot of detail. The Quran mentions this incident that we will narrate to you the true event, the true incident, Bilhaq. This is Quran highlighting that the books, the previous books have this information, but people have concocted that information. Quran gives us the correct event and incident. And the details of that incident where we learn so much and we read it on, on Friday. Allah give us tawfiq. There's a lot of protection and blessings in this. And we learn from this incident the importance of protecting our iman, even though we might lose everything, but our iman is priority. And this was a lesson given to the Muslims as well. And then the story of uh, Dhul Qarnain also is in Surah Kahf. But interestingly, the incident of Ar-Ruh, the answer in regards to the soul, as they said, this came in Quran, but the answer was not given. وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي They ask you, O Muhammad Wasallam, concerning the ruh, the soul. Tell them, this is by the command of Allah. وَمَا أُوْتِيْتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا And you have not been given from knowledge except a little. Meaning Allah's knowledge is unlimited. Our knowledge is limited. What we know is nothing in comparison to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something else we learn from here. That Quran, when responding to these two questions, the surah al-kahf, where the answers were given and the answers were provided, this surah discusses the two questions that the answers were provided. And the chapter al-Isra, where the answer was not given, that's where al-Ruh was discussed. Something else we learn. From here we learn the beauty of the quran e Karim. Quran is not a book like any human's words or teachings or writings. This book is miraculous. Something we should learn that how to link between every surah and every chapter and every verse. A master of this is Hazrat Mufti Zawal Haqsab, Damat Barakatuhum. Allah Ta'ala bless Hazrat in his health and his life. And Allah give us all to fiqh, to ponder over the meanings and the beauty of the quran e Karim. This was during the Meccan stage, but when the Muslims migrated to Medina Munawwara and they arrived in Medina Munawwara, the Meccans on other occasions would come and ask opinions in regards to the Muslims. And people like Ka'b bin Ashraf, who was from the Banu Nadir tribe. Father was from the Arabs and his mother came from the Jews and he had become Jew. And he had given great support to the Meccan people against the Muslims. And then when the Muslims, when the Rasulullah ﷺ made hijrah to Medina Manawara, there were Jews living in Medina Manawara, namely the Banu Quraidha, the Banu Nadir, and the Banu Qaynuqa. Now these three, three Jewish tribes had loggerheads with each other, but they had a sinister plan. They had become, to a great extent, in control of the economy of Medina Munawwara. What had happened was, they would always instigate and cause wars between the Aus and the Khazraj people. Now the Aus and Khazraj were two tribes that hailed from the same mother and father. Their mother historically is known as Qayla. So they shared the same mother. But the ajib part is, the interesting part, very strange part is, 
that the Jews now had got these two tribes that actually are family to actually fight and they would instigate hatred for one against the other because they wanted to control the situation from behind the scenes. And this seems to be their treacherous way throughout history when we learn about them. That's why logically they should have been happy that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is coming to Medina Munawwara. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is mentioned in their books. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is referred to clearly. Quran mentions, يَعْرِفُونَهُ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ They recognized Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam like their own children. But the sad part is they were very, very upset. What they were upset about was, now they won't be able to control the affairs and won't be able to do as they please because they were changing their teachings according to their whims and fancies. They would actually threaten the people of Medina, the Arabs, saying that when Muhammad ﷺ comes, we will torture you Arabs and will destroy you like Aad and Thamud were destroyed. Sad reality is that instead of them sharing the message of Tawheed with their local citizens and local brethren living in Medina Munawwara together, instead of explaining to them that you all should not be worshipping idols, you all should become like us in worshipping Allah, that see we worship one Allah, Something that the Jews maintained at that time was their belief in the oneness of Allah. Hazrat Mawlana Abu Hassan Ali Nadwi rahmatullahi writes that sadly the reality of the Jews was that degradation had come into them as far as their morals, as far as their character. And leave alone the entire deen, even objecting over the attributing of partners to Allah, that also they left. They know that Allah is one. When they saw their local brethren ascribing partners unto Allah, لَمْ يُحَرِّكْ سَاكِنَهُمْ وَلَمْ يُزْعِجْهُمْ This didn't hurt them. This didn't sh shake something in them. That how can our neighbors, Allah who made all of us, Allah who is one, Allah who is pure, Allah who created everything, how can our neighbors, Ascribe partners unto Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Mawlana writes this in regards to the Jews. But then when reading this, the thought crosses my mind always, is what about you and I? We've become the same. We live as Muslims. We go to the masjid. Yes, we pray. Yes, we make dhikrullah. But when we see people, our associates, our friends, our neighbors, ascribing partners unto Allah, does it hurt us? Does it trouble us? Does it instill a worry in us for these people that we see every day and they are going to end up in the fire of Jahannam. Study Surah Mu'minun, the last 10-15 verses from Surah Al-Mu'minun. Allah speaks about this individual going to Jahannam, suffering in the heat of hellfire. تَلْفَحُ وَجُوهَهُمُ النَّارُ وَهُمْ فِيهَا كَالِحُونَ where the, the blazing fire of Jahannam will burn them, will burn them. And out of the horror of that fire, their mouths will open, where the upper lip will reach the head, and the lower lip will reach the navel in horror. And then they will beg for respite, and they will beg, and they will beg in the suffering. Then they will be told, fiha wa la Do not even speak. I ask myself and yourself, this severe, Punishment in the hereafter. Don't you and I take pity on others? Or have we also become like the Jews who didn't even worry about their neighbors? But look how Allah gives hidayah. When the six youngsters from Medina Munawwara met Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in the Hajj, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa was inviting people to Allah, all the Meccan, all the, the, the people who would come to Makkah, for pilgrimage, Allah's Nabi would invite them to Allah. And then he met these six young men from Medina, and Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa invited them to Allah. And they looked at each other saying, we've heard about this Nabi of Allah from our brethren, the Jews. And then they said, they used to threaten us. Let us embrace his faith before even they reach him. And the six of them embraced Islam. And look at Sahaba. They returned to Medina Munawwara with this message. The six, the next year becomes 12. 
five from the previous year, seven from the from from from, from this year. And then they asked Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam to send the teacher. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam sent two Sahaba, Hazrat Mus'ab bin Umair, Hazrat Abdullah bin Ummi Maktoum radhiyallahu anhum, to make the effort of inviting people to Allah and teaching them Deen in Madinah Munawwara. And Islam spread rapidly. That's how they superseded the Jews to embrace Islam. Hazrat Salama bin Salama bin Waqsh radhiyallahu anhu. He was a Badri Sahabi. He says we had a Jewish neighbor. And very often he would come and he would say to us, and Hazrat Salama says, I was the youngest. And then this one Jewish individual comes to us and I was sitting with my shawl outside the veranda of my home and he gathered the people of Abdul Ashhal, and he said to us that, you know, this life is very, very short. There's a life after this where there is resurrection. There's the day of judgment. There's reckoning. There's the scale of deeds. There's Jannah. There's hellfire. And he's saying this to the mushrikeen. And then one of them asked, that, is this really going to happen? Are people going to be resurrected? And then end up in Jannah and Jahannam and be rewarded for their deeds? He says, yes, I take oath in the being through whom we can take oath by him, meaning Allah. Then we asked him, what is the sign? He said, the final Nabi of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He says, this message I did hear from him. Then sadly, a lot of them, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa arrived, a lot of them refused to embrace Islam. It was jealousy. It was hatred. It was rancor. Our mother, Hazrat Safiya binti Huyay, radiyallahu anha, she says, I was very young and I was loved by my father, my father Huyay bin Akhtab, and my uncle Abu Yasir. Whenever they saw me or any other of their own children, they always took me, the both of them. And when Muhammad وسلم, arrived in Medina Munawwara, and he was in Quba, in the area known as Banu Amr bin Auf, my father, my uncle went to see him. And I saw them returning, upset, lethargic. They left early in the morning, ghalas. It was still dark, but in the darkness, after dawn, there was brightness. Ghalas, it's called. And when they were arriving, it was about sunset. They saw me, they didn't even notice me. I heard my father and uncle speak and they said to each other, what do you think? My father and uncle respond that yes, yes, he is definitely the one. Now they're asking each other, should we accept? Should we refuse? What are you going to do? He says, I have decided, adawatuhu wallahi ma baqeet. As long as there's a breath in me, I will be his enemy no matter what. So there was so much of hatred. There was so much of animosity. When Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa arrived in Medina Munawwara, Allah's Nabi was very kind to them. But it seems, and actually there was a treaty, there was a truce of peace between the Muslims of Medina Munawwara, under whom was Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa who is now the ruler of Medina Munawwara, and the Jews. And they were given the freedom of religion. They were given lots of rights. This was even before the verdict of Jizya came. They were given so afterwards the hukam of Allah, the decision of Allah regarding jizya came. But they were given so much of rights that even if anybody attacks Medina Munawwara on either side, the Jews or the Muslims, they would together defend Medina Munawwara. There was an amazing peaceful treaty that took place. But it seems what they were upset about was they didn't want to change. They didn't want Allah's pleasure. Too much of living over the privileges of the past Allah save us. This is the disease. A person, for example, feels my grandfather was like this, or I come from that family, or I come from so much of uh, nobility of the past. Let Quran speaks about the Jews and Ahlul Kitab. Ya Bani Israel, adhkuru ni'mati allati an'amtu alaykum wa anni faddaltukum ala al-alameen. O Bani Israel, O Bani Israel, remember Allah's favors upon you. And your forefathers. And Allah has made you superior in your time. In the past, you were superior over, the, over, over all the people. Allah gave them such privilege in the past. Allah helped them. Allah blessed them. Allah raised them. But certainly they were ungrateful. And they turned down Allah's bounties. And then in the Bible itself, Allah tells them. The verses are clear in the Bible where Allah says to them, I will shame you with another nation an unlettered nation, and you will be put to disgrace because you did not fulfill. And Allah then brings the Ummah of Muhammad who will fulfill. 
And then they were even told about the descriptions of Muhammad sallallahu And it was Allah's test for them to bring Iman on Muhammad sallallahu and to be happy with Allah's decision that the final Nabi of Allah will be from the offspring of Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam and not Hazrat Ishaq alayhi salatu wasalam like the previous Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. And to help them believe and bring Iman when the Muslims arrived in Medina Munawwara, the Qibla was Baytul Muqaddas for approximately 16 months. And ulama write under this, this was amongst the wisdom of this was to actually allow and make it easy for the Jews of Medina to realize that this Nabi of Allah is on truth. He's even following the Qibla of the Anbiya alayhi salatu wasalam. And this was the Qibla still of the Jews. And afterwards Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was turned to ch- told to change in the direction of the Kaaba. But because the Muslims were so attached to the Kaaba in Makkah Mukarramah, they would stand on that side of the Kaaba where both Qiblas were faced. Yeah, in Medina Munawwara, the directions are different. They had to face Baytul Muqaddas until months down the line, the Tahweelul Qibla took place where the Muslims were told to return or, or now face Kaaba Mukarramah, Kaaba Musharrafah, the Kaaba Sharif. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always preserve the Haramain Sharifain. These are the lands of, of Noor, the lands of Hidayat. Allah preserve these Mubarak lands. And may Allah ta'ala preserve and protect this other Qibla, which was the first Qibla of the Muslims as well, which is Baytul, Baytul Muqaddas. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve these blessed lands through His Karam and His mercy. Despite Allah's mercy upon them, and the opportunity given to them to embrace the truth and accept it. But so many of them refuted. They already started showing their ungratefulness and ingratitude right in the early Medinan stage. For example, after Badr, one sad event took place that they had prominent marketplace areas. This was the Jews of Banu Nadir, for example. This was the first Jewish tribe that had this interaction with the Muslims, even though all of them were living in Medina Manuwara, but this incident specifically. And in their bazaar, they had a lot of jewelry shops. So there was one Muslim woman who was properly veiled, and she comes into this bazaar, and she wanted to purchase this jewelry. And as she sees some jewelry that she likes, and she wants to pay, the Jewish vendor there says, that I cannot do this trade with you. So she asks why. So he says, because you are veiled, uncover yourself and then we can do business with you like normal, like how you people were before. They can't bear it that the Muslims were changing, the people were becoming better. They couldn't bear this because before this they would always maintain and keep the hatred between these two tribes and they would then run the economy and then charge exorbitant rates in usury and riba to the Arabs. For example, if one was defeating the other, they would then go to the one who were being defeated, loaning money to them with high, uh, you know, uh, riba taxes and rates that they had to pay in return, just so that the war between the two tribes continue. And like that, when vice versa, they would do the exact same thing. And then they would charge them exorbitant amounts. And now when people are seeing the truth and becoming good human beings, they couldn't bear it. Like here, he says, I cannot do this deal with you. And now this woman says, I have to keep myself veiled. I cannot do this. And then he had actually got someone to tie the rear of her of her cloak. At the bottom, it was tied. And as this person, he tie, ties the bottom to a portion in her back discreetly. And as she gets up, her legs and her, her legs become exposed. And this hurt her very much. And she cried. And she, she screamed. And then a Muslim comes to her defense. And a war broke out there. Where one Jew and this Muslim both passed away. And then when Rasulullah would ask them about why would they do things like this. Why wouldn't they live under the, the rules of Medina Munawwara. That live peacefully, deal with people. This is the religion of the Muslims. Why do you ill-treat them because of them practicing their religion? Then they started with their attitude towards Muhammad wasallam. You think you defeated the Arabs in Badr. You can tell us what to do. When you fight against us, we'll show you who are the strongest of people. And very, very disrespectful to, to Muhammad wasallam. 
and then Allah's Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam banished them from Medina Munawwara. But then, when they were banished from Medina Munawwara, then the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, came in, telling them that don't worry, don't listen to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You don't have to depart. We are here to defend you. And like that, the hypocrites, people who are not true to Islam, people who are not true and loyal to the ad, to, to 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 Islam, but they have a lot of uh, you know filth inside the hearts and outwardly just want to pretend like Abdullah bin Ubay and people the like of that Allah Ta'ala save us but this was one encounter in the early Medinan stage something else interesting is that this incident took place in the month of Shawwal where they were banished when they ill-treated this Sahabi yeah? and they were banished from Medina Munawara another interesting historical event that did take place in the past was when Tabban Asad, known as Tubba al Himyari, who was a Yemeni ruler, who passed by Medina Munawwara, and there were some wars that broke out between the people of Medina Munawwara and this Yemeni king, and in that his son also died. And there was wars, but he was astonished by the character of the Arabs of Medina, the Aus and the Khazraj. That even though there was wars, but these people were very, very hospitable. That touched him very much. And then he came into contact with some Jews in Medina Munawwara. Because it seems the Jews were there for a very long time in history. And the reasons why they went there are different. One was they were banished from their lands. Amongst the reasons was the finality of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because they would actually await Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this Jewish scholar happened to explain to Tabban that you shouldn't be fighting these people because this is the arrival place of the final Nabi of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, is that so? And they explained to him and he was touched by that. And he embraced Islam and he believed in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is written in the books of history where he then built a, a beautiful home and in those standards and he made intention that this should be for Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he left some of his relatives to live on there, to live further on. And he then departed. But he requested this Jewish scholar to, and some of them to join him. And as he was returning to Yemen, he passed Makkah Mukarramah. And there was some feud that took place and there was a war that was about to be to break out. But then this Jewish scholar told him that, you know, in, in this land, is the Kaaba, the special home, the house of Allah Ta'ala, which is the Qibla. And this was built by Hazrat Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. You shouldn't let this war take place, but you should go there and circumambulate and show respect. They, he said to them, why don't you all come? They said, we can't because of idolatry taking place around there. He went, he performed the tawaf, and he was historically the first person to clothe the Kaaba. Anyway, he then returns to Yemen. But in Medina, when he departed, he left a note. And in this note, it stated, Shahidtu ala ahmada annahu rasoolun min Allahi barin nasam falaw mudda umri ila umrihi lakuntu waziran lahu wabna am wajahadtu bisayfi a'da'ahu wafarrajitu an sadrihi kulla gham I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the Nabi of Allah, the creator of every soul. And if my life can only be expanded and extended longer and I'll be in the company of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and support him and be his minister and be his helper, waziran lahu, I'll carry all his burdens and his worries and I'll be like his family and I'll strive to defend him from anyone who harms him and I will alleviate any pang any worry, any trouble in his chest. Allahu Akbar. What an intention. What an intention by this king. Ya Allah. Allah give us all. Allah give us tawfiq. The ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa That we also take some burden. That burden that was in the chest of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for humanity. That we should also take onto our chests. And take onto our shoulders. That pain and that worry and that cry of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Interestingly, it's reported in history that Hazrat Abu Ayyub Ansari who comes from the offspring of that same ruler and the house that Abu Ayyub welcomed Allah's Nabi in was actually the structure built 
by Taban with the intention of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam residing there. Ya Allah, we learn the importance of intention. What intention can do? That we want hidayat for our children. We want hidayat for our offspring. We want deen to remain in our families till qiyamah. We should make intentions and we should try our best and then rely on and firstly rely on Allah subhanahu wa taala and then make out outright effort to the best of our ability for, for, for this to happen because this talab is something that Allah Ta'ala loves when we have this yearning desire when we have this yearning desire for humanity's hidayah when we have this yearning desire to please Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala this is something that every one of us should worry about let's not take this for granted as far as dunya is concerned we make an effort as far as our deen we have to worry and we have to plan and we have to make an effort and more importantly we have to beg our Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so my point here is that not every person is bad there was so much of good as well yes there was hatred there was animosity but not in every person there were also people like this great sahabi Hazrat Hussain radiallahu anhu what they saw he was a Jewish rabbi he says when I heard that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had arrived in Medina Munawwara, Kabbartu, I started saying, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. My aunt, Khalda, Khalda bint al-Harith, she said to me, what's wrong with you? If Hazrat Musa alayhi salam has come, you wouldn't be as happy as this. So I said to my aunt, oh my aunt, this is the brother of Hazrat Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. He is on the deen of, Muhammad, of Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. So she asked me, is he the one that we read about in our books? And we were always told that he will arrive. I said to her, yes, my aunt. And then he says, I went to meet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa I saw his Mubarak face and I embraced Islam. He was a Jewish rabbi. So we learned there were many Sahaba radiallahu anhum like this. He said, I looked at Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam's face. I knew this is never not possible. This is the face of, of, of truth. This can never be the face of a liar. He heard Allah's Nabi Sallallahu words. He heard Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi teachings. He says, this is the Nabi of Allah. He heard Allah's Nabi say amongst the, the first things Allah's Nabi said, Ya ayyuhan nas, O oh people, O oh people, at'imu ta'am, wasilu al-arham, wa afshu salam Ya ayyuhan nas, afshu salam wa at'imu ta'am, wasilu al-arham, wa sallu bil-layli wa nasu niyam, tadkhulu al-jannata bisalam. Who's the narrator? Hazrat Abdullah, Hazrat Hussain bin Salam. O oh, humanity, spread salams to everyone. Afshu salam. Feed people, feed people. Join ties. Don't break ties. Join ties. Maintain ties. Win people. Ikram people. Love people. Join people. Sir al-Arham. At night when everyone is asleep, you beg Allah and pray to Allah when everyone is asleep. And like that, your entry into Jannah will be with peace. Salam. And who's the narrator of this hadith? Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa loved him so much. Allah's Nabi changed his name to Abdullah. Even though Hussein, there's another Sahabi Hussein, but definitely the wisdom of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa was to give the Sahabi this very special name, Hazrat Abdullah. Abdullah bin Salam. He was so close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says to Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, O Nabi of Allah, the Jews really, really revere me and respect me. But, you know, I want you to ask them about me. And then I will tell them the truth that I have changed. I want you to see how they will then just change their statement. And they will then blaspheme me in an unjust, incorrect, inappropriate manner. Allah's Nabi Wasallam let him sit inside. And he was concealed and called all of them. And then amongst the discussion... Allah's Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi did tell them that do you know the final Nabi of Allah and so forth and his arrival Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asked them Ayyu rajulin Abdullah ibn Salamin fikum Who is Abdullah bin Salam to you? At that time Allah's Nabi said Hussain bin Salam to actually win them into the discussion and win them into this discussion as well. They said he is the best. Khayruna wa abnu khayrina He comes from the best family. He comes from a very, very noble lineage. He is most scholarly. He is amongst our most senior and the best in character. And then Allah's Nabi said, what if he embraces Islam? Would you? They said, not possible, never. And he comes out and he says to them, 
O people, do you remember I always warned you and informed you and taught you about the final Nabi of Allah, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa This is him. They said, no, no, we weren't referring to you. He is actually the worst of us, the lowest, the filth of society, the most uh, degraded of society and the most downtrodden and the most despicable and his family is the same. And they t- changed their statements regarding him instantaneously. And this happened to few others as well. Radiallahu anhum, but they maintained the iman. Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu anhu says, I went to give them dawat. I went to give dawat to my people, my relatives, my aunt Khalda. The other report says her name was Khalida radiallahu anha, embraced Islam. He says, I invited my nephews. He says, I said to them, Lakad alim tu ma. Both of you know, one was Salama, one was Muhajir. You know that Allah mentioned this in the Torah. Inni ba'ithum min wuldi Ismail nabiyyan ismuhu Ahmad. That I will send from the offspring of Hazrat Ismail alayhi salam. A nabi of Allah whose name will be Ahmad. Man amana bihi faqad ihtada. Wa man lam yu'min bihi fahuwa mal'oon. He who brings iman in him will be in the right path of hidayat and guidance. And he who refutes and refuses him will be accursed in Allah's sight. Salama embraced Islam and my other relative Muhajir refused and like that he invited so many of the Jews to his Islam. It's reported that more than 30 of them, Alhamdulillah, embraced Islam. But then they were ostracized and then they were belittled. Hazrat Mu'adh bin Jabal radiallahu would go to the Jewish areas in Medina Manwara because they had their prominent vicinities and areas. And he would go and make gush amongst them and invite them to Allah. And he would say to them, wasn't it you all who would notify us and teach us about the final Nabi of Allah and now you'll refuse him? But it was the hatred in them. And it was that pride and arrogance that was blocking Iman's permeation. It was blocking Iman from entering the heart. Because pride and arrogance are qualities that Allah hates. That when one wants to look down upon others and one doesn't want to accept the truth, that means the love of Allah is not there. When we have the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can accept the command of Allah because it pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even though it may be against our wishes or our wants or our needs or the things we love or our passions. Because why? Because we must want what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's reported that Hazrat Abdullah bin Salam radiallahu came with the people who embraced Islam from the Jewish community. And they complained to Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inna manazilana ba'idah. O Nabi of Allah, we stay so far from your masjid. We don't have a majlis. We don't have a place to serve. We don't have a place, you know, where we can talk to our friends and our people when they see us. O Nabi of Allah, how they treat us. They ill-treat us. They hurt us. They belittle us. Allah revealed verses of the Qur'an that don't worry. Inna ma waliyukum Allah. وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ Allah, Allah is your friend, your guardian, your protector. Allah's Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. And the believers are your friends. Make them your friends. Make the believers your friends. To conclude, Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in turn Sahaba radiallahu anhum gave everyone a chance. Invited everyone to Allah. Saw hope in everyone. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave du'as to those who tortured him in, in Taif. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa made effort and showed love and kindness to the children of those who would torture him and belittle him and degrade him and hurt him in Makkah Mukarramah. And when their children would come to him, he would invite them and welcome them. Imagine showing love to the child of one who hates you and detests you and belittles you and degrades you. Allahu Akbar. Allah's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is rahmatul lil alameen. And Sahaba radiallahu anhum learned the same practice from the beloved of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That's why there were so many Jewish people at that time in Medina Manuwara who embraced Islam. Hazrat Mukhairiq radiallahu anhu. Especially Hazrat Safiya, our mother, Ummul Mu'mineen radiallahu anha. And inshallah we will discuss further. But the point here is... Give everyone hope. There is a chance. Haji Sahib would say, Rahmatullah li Haji Abdul Wahab Sahib, make effort on everyone and love goodness for them. Love kindness for them. Like that brother who was returning to Palestine in Jamaat. So Hazrat told him, when he asked for du'as, that Allah accept me for this work. He said, how will you be accepted for this work when you don't have love for the whole of humanity? And then he thought about it as he was returning and he gets to the border points and the person is, you know, interrogating him and being rude and cruel towards him. And he was kind and polite. And the person says, what did you go there to learn in Pakistan? 
He said, I went to learn how to love people like you. He says, what? The incident is lengthy, but how that this person was touched and then ended up dropping him off home. And this same person embraced Islam and changed his life. How love can change a person? The point is, we can dialogue with people. We can discuss with people. Allah Ta'ala gave us tawfiq to go to Palestine in Jamaat in the Ara Markaz. There was one brother who was Jewish and he had embraced Islam and he was in the Markaz there. So he wanted to join our Jamaat. The Amir Sahib there, Sheikh Iyad, Allah bless him, he was worried about and reluctant at first to send him with us because maybe he was a spy, maybe he was something or the other. And towards the end of our tashkil there, towards the end of the 40 days, we were in the Masjid Al-Aqsa, a Masjid near Masjid Al-Aqsa there, and Amir Sahib sent him to spend five days with us. Subhanallah, what a brother, what a brother. Allahu Akbar. Allah is really, Allah is the giver of hidayat. And Allah Ta'ala is the changer of hearts. But where we can, we can invite one one person to Allah Ta'ala. Read this, uh, listen to this lecture of Shaykh Ahmad Didat, Rahmatullah Ali, regarding Arabs and Israel, conflict or conciliation. Quite an interesting lecture. Listen to it. We'll pick up some points on how to discuss with them from the Torah itself, from Genesis and from Deuteronomy 18.18, 18, showing them that how our deen actually upholds the teachings of all the Anbiya alayhim salatu wasalam. Somebody Allah will give hidayat to. Interesting is the Kal Guzari of Uncle Ibrahim, a Tur Turkish Muslim who aged 50. He owned a ration shop in a building that contained a Jewish family in France. And this was in 1957. Every morning, the family would send their son Jade to the shop of this Turkish Muslim Ibrahim. And he would go and collect some goods there and every day he would steal a packet of chocolates. One day, after some months had went by or years, he forgot. And uncle called him back and said, you forgot your chocolates today. Then the youngster realized that and he asked, uncle, did you see me all this time? He says, don't worry, you just take your chocolates. He says, uncle, I'll never steal from today. He says, I don't want you to ever steal again from anyone. But every day he would come and he would say and he would take his chocolates because uncle told him to take his chocolates. And years later, how he became so close to Uncle Ibrahim and he would, uh, whenever he had troubles, he would come and talk to Uncle Ibrahim and Uncle Ibrahim would open a book inside a wooden box and any challenge this youngster had, Uncle would open to the pages and recite to him and explain these verses to him and these verses would solve all the problems of this youngster until Uncle Ibrahim passed away and this youngster was very, very emotional. He was about 27 or so at that time. But Uncle Ibrahim left in his wasiyah, his will, that this box, the wooden box must be given with the kitab in it, with the book in it, must be given to Jade. Jade cried so much at the demise of Uncle Ibrahim. And years later, when he would face problems, he would say, I wish I had you here to open the box and read the verses to me. But he opened the box and saw the note in it written that when you face anything, go to this Tunisian brother and he will read read from the book and later he realized and he learned that that book was the quran -i kareem the incident is lengthy he became muslim ya allah and how many people he invited to islam he brought over six thousand jews and christians to islam so allah is the giver of hidayah we have to invite we have to tell people we have to talk to people we have to dialogue with people let's do what we can let's make a difference where we can and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do the rest. And others who have different positions, they will fulfill their responsibility. But let us fulfill our duty as this is also an injunction in the quran kareem And the Ahlul Kitab are mentioned with high esteem in the Quran as well. So let's share with them these messages from the quran kareem in such a high, noble manner. Quran addresses them. Allah give us the understanding. Wa sallallahu